Hi, this is Jeffrey Reddick, creator of Final Destination. Greetings, Slashaholics. This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror books, the Bard's Blood Horror Shakespeare books. Hey guys, this is Jason Brooks, Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th Vengeance. Hey, this is Slasher Pepper. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th Part 6. This is William Patterson, known to Friday the 13th fans as Eric Morris. Hi, this is Deborah Voorhees from Friday the 13th Part 5. Hey folks, this is Adam Marcus, director of Jason Goes to Hell and Secret Santa. <laughs> Hello, kitties. This is John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper. Hi, this is Kane Hodder. Better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. And you're listening. You're listening. And you're listening. And you're listening. I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening. You are listening. And you are listening. And you are lucky enough to be listening. Okay, boils and ghouls. You are listening. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. The 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To 80s Slasher Librarian. To 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. To the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. Don't forget to visit the 80 Slasher Librarian merch store. Lots of items, lots of designs. You pick the color and size. And be sure to use promo code TINOFF for 10% off your purchase. Link in the description below. And as always, tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. That's Alleyway, Bonanza Jellybean, Bree, Carl Eakin, Cecilia Spears, Allison Seib, Hawaii, Iron Elixir, Catherine McClear, Kristen K, Lauren Vaught, Liam Anderson, Michael, Ryan Woodward, Sean Campbell, William Schaefer, and Willow Ravenwood. If you would like to support the channel on Patreon, you can sign up for as low as $2 to $5 per month. There are several tiers to choose from, and depending on which tier you select, you'll get free ebooks, early access, post show to the podcast, voice a character in an audiobook, free merch, and so much more. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group page, our Twitter, and our subreddit. The links to those are in the description below. Enjoy tonight's narration. I have a story that I'd like to tell about this guy. You all know me and we're scared as hell. He comes to me at night after I call into bed. He's burnt up like a weenie and his name is Fred. He wears the same hat and sweater every single day. And even if it's hot outside, he wears it anyway. He's gone when I'm awake, but he shows up when I'm asleep. I can't believe that there's a nightmare on my street. I walked in the house, the big bad fresh prince. But Freddy killed all that noise real quick. He grabbed me by my neck and said, Here's what we'll do. We got a lot of work here. Me and you. The souls of your friends, you and I will claim. You got the body and I got the brain. I said, yo, Fred, I think you got me all wrong. I ain't partners with nobody with nails that long. Look, I'll be honest, man, this team won't work. The girls won't be on you, Fred, your face is all burned. I pat him on the shoulder, said, thanks for stopping by. Then I opened up the door and said, take care. A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, the novelization by Jeffrey Cooper. Chapter 1 Jesse Walsh had only been living in the old house on Elm Street for a few weeks when the nightmares began. It seemed to Jesse that he was much too happy with his life to be having such spooky dreams. Admittedly, he hadn't been too pleased at first to learn that his father was being transferred to a branch office in the suburbs. Jesse was a city kid and damn proud of it. After 17 years learning how to cope with life on the mean urban streets, Jesse wasn't sure he was ready to deal with a bunch of rich kids who had never been into anything heavier than hanging out at the local shopping mall. Much to his surprise, however, Springwood had turned out to be a pretty nice place to live. Living on a clean and quiet street in a virtually crime-free neighborhood was a refreshing change from life in the big city. And leaving the house each morning with no expectation of being beaten up or robbed on the way to school was something Jesse thought he could very easily learn to live with. Even the kids at school were turning out to be a lot hipper than he had expected. 
It might take some time, but Jesse knew that he would eventually find his niche in the complex social structure of Springwood High. In the meantime, of course, there was Lisa Paletti. Whenever things started getting him down, all Jesse had to do was think about Lisa, and all his troubles seemed to disappear. The day he met Lisa Paletti, Jesse knew that life in Springwood was going to be just fine after all. All things considered, Jesse would have been about as contented as a teenage boy could be if it weren't for those god-awful nightmares. The nightmare he had had that morning was fairly typical. The dream started innocently enough Jesse riding the bus home from school. It was a beautiful spring day and everyone on the bus was glad that another week of school had come to an end. Even Joe, the bus driver, was in too good a mood to yell at the kid blasting the radio in the back of the bus. Joe never talked much, except to yell at somebody for breaking one of the rules. But he always seemed like a nice enough old guy, and most of the kids wished him a good weekend as they got off of the bus. By the time the bus reached Jesse's part of town, there was no one left on board except Jesse, the driver, and a couple of giggly girls. Jesse squirmed uncomfortably in his seat as one of the girls looked at him and whispered something to her friend. Then the two girls broke out in uproarious laughter, and Jesse felt his face flush. It suddenly grew very warm on the bus, and Jesse tried opening a window. The window refused to budge. He would have tried another window, but he already felt as if he were attracting more than his fair share of attention. He looked out the window and saw the mother and kid brother of one of the girls waiting at the side of the curb. The girl stood up, waved goodbye to her friend, and walked toward the front of the bus. She was almost at the door when the bus suddenly sped up and shot past the intersection. Hey! shouted the girl. That was my stop! But the bus driver paid no attention. In fact, the bus seemed to be going even faster now, almost knocking the girl off of her feet as it sharply turned the next corner. Hey, Joe, cried the second girl, let us off. If the driver heard, he made no sign of acknowledgement. Jesse looked out the window and noticed that the weather had undergone a drastic change. The sun that shone so brilliantly just moments ago had completely disappeared. Instead, threatening clouds filled the sky and a wicked wind was whipping the trees into a frenzy. The bus had passed the last of the houses now and was headed into open terrain at a startling speed. One of the girls had begun to cry as her friend made her way to the front of the bus, struggling to keep her balance as the vehicle hurtled along the bumpy road. The girl was only a few feet from the driver when he stuck out his arm to throw the shift into high gear. She stopped cold when she saw that his sleeve was charred and smoking. From the back of the bus, Jesse could see the strange glove he wore, its razor-sharp talons gleaming in the darkness. And then the bus swerved wildly, throwing its passengers onto the floor. Lightning flashed and the sky had turned black as night. Thick clouds of steam poured out from under the hood of the bus as it crashed wildly through a wall of overgrown brambles on the side of the road. All hell broke loose as the bus hurtled over rocks and through ditches, leaving a trail of toppled trees in its fearsome wake. Skidding wildly across the desert landscape, the bus began to rumble and shake as if the solid earth below were about to explode. Jesse looked out the window just as the front wheel smashed into a jagged boulder and snapped off the axle. He held on for dear life as the smoke-filled bus rocked violently from side to side before bouncing to a bone-shaking halt. Slowly, Jesse and the two girls lifted themselves up off the floor. The temperature in the smoky bus was well over a hundred degrees, and it was almost impossible to breathe the stifling air. Every door and window was still locked tight. And then the ground beneath the bus began to split apart, as if the planet itself was opening up at the seams. Huge chunks of land crumbled inward and toppled to oblivion, leaving the bus to teeter precariously on a narrow stone platform surrounded by nothing but a steamy abyss. Jesse smelled something burning. He looked to the front of the bus and saw that the dashboard was on fire, thick black clouds of smoke billowing to the ceiling. Then he saw the man who had been driving the bus lurch toward him 
and he knew that the creature in the filthy red and green sweater was definitely not Joe the bus driver. Smoke rose from his body as if he himself had recently been on fire, and Jesse thought he saw hot globs of molten flesh dripping off the man's charred skin. And as the man walked toward the terrified passengers, his finger knives swept along the seats, leaving deep gashes in the green vinyl upholstery. Jesse knew he would never forget the horrible sound of metal scraping against metal as the horrible blade screeched against the ceiling and the steel support poles. The three teenagers shared one common desire now, and that desire was to escape from the madman in the dirty sweater. Desperately, they raced from window to window, but every window was locked. One of the girls yanked hard on the emergency door lever and watched helplessly as the lever came loose in her hand. And then the driver stood before her, his awful talon glove raised high. Jesse could see the man's horribly scarred face beneath his battered fedora hat, and he knew in that instant that the man wouldn't stop until everyone on the bus was as dead as he was. There was no way out and Jesse knew it. No way out, that is, until his alarm clock went off and he woke up screaming as he had so many mornings before. Why can't Jesse wake up like everyone else? asked his kid sister at the breakfast table that morning. Angela was 11 years old and had never had a nightmare in her life. Having her big brother wake up with a scream of terror every morning was definitely starting to get on her nerves. Good morning, Jesse mumbled, joining his family at the breakfast table a few minutes later. Good morning, honey. Despite her cheerful greeting, there was an unmistakable look of concern on Shirley Walsh's expressive face. Jesse's mother was the only one in the family besides Jesse himself who seemed to be taking the nightmare seriously. His sister had no idea why her big brother was acting so weird, and his father was of the firmly held belief that the boy was much too old to be making such a big fuss over a couple of bad dreams. "'You got your room straightened out yet?' asked Ken Walsh that morning. Jesse's father was a practical man who believed in practical solutions to life's little problems. He had never been reluctant to express his opinion about anything, and it was his often expressed opinion that the only thing wrong with Jesse was that he was a lazy kid who had been spoiled all of his life by an overindulgent mother. "'It's getting there,' said Jesse in answer to his father's question. It was the same answer he had given to the same question every day for the past month. In point of fact, Jesse's room was still cluttered with half-unpacked boxes of junk that he had to carefully circumnavigate every time he tried weaving his way in or out of the room. "'We've only been living here six weeks now,' said his father, pointing at the boy with his fork. "'I want that room unpacked by tomorrow night.' Jesse nodded and yawned. Would you like some eggs, Jesse? asked his mother as she slid another panful of scrambled eggs onto her husband's plate. Jesse was about to reply when his mother noticed that Angela had thrust her hand deep into the box of breakfast cereal. What are you doing, dear? she asked. I'm trying to get the Fu Man fingers, the girl replied, spilling Fu Man chews all over the kitchen table. Jesse glanced at the cereal box and saw a cartoon of the evil oriental villain pointing at a bowl of cereal with one of his long pointed fingernails. Above the cartoon was the caption, Free Inside Fu Man Fingers. He gazed at the drawing of a hand wearing several of the long red plastic fingernails and felt himself shudder. Jesse? He looked away from the cereal box and made a conscious effort to give his mother his full attention. Eggs? She said. Jesse glanced at the drawing on the cereal box for another second, and then shook his head. No thanks, Mom, he said, wondering what it was about that picture that made him feel so uneasy. I'll just have some milk. Are you okay? I'm fine, said Jesse. Just a little warm, I guess. It's really hot upstairs. I know, said his mother, looking pointedly at her husband. 
I wish you'd call someone to check out that air conditioning, Ken. Ken Walsh sat up straight in his chair, a butter knife clenched tightly in his hand as if he were preparing to do battle. I know what's wrong with the air conditioning, he insisted. Just needs a shot of Freon is all. Uh-oh, said Jesse, a grin on his face. Dad's fixing something again. Everybody hit the deck. Don't be a smart ass, said his father. Jesse caught his mother's disapproving look and tried hard not to laugh. So, said his mother, eager to change the subject. Is school going all right? Okay, I guess, said Jesse with a shrug. Are you making friends? You know how it is, he replied. Parents always asked how things were going at school, he thought, but you could never talk to them about the things that really mattered. The doorbell rang just as Angela managed to yank out a bag full of Fu Man fingers along with a half a box of Fu Manchu cereal. That's Lisa, said Jesse, jumping out of his seat and grabbing his jacket off the hook near the front door. I better get going. Who's Lisa? asked his father. But the question went unanswered. Jesse was already out the door. Your timing was perfect, Jesse told Lisa as they walked briskly toward his beat-up old falcon. I was getting a third degree in there. How come? No reason, said Jesse with a shrug. He opened the car door and the girl got in. Lisa smiled as she watched Jesse walk around to the driver's side of the car. Jesse was different from the other boys in Springwood. Lisa wasn't sure what about him was so special, but there was definitely something about Jesse that set him apart from any boy she had ever gone out with before. Not that they were really going out yet, Lisa reminded herself. Jesse had struck up a conversation with her in the cafeteria last month and found out that she lived on the other end of Elm Street. He offered her a ride to school the next morning, and they had been traveling together ever since. It was true that he hadn't asked her out yet, but Lisa knew it was just a matter of time, a formality. There was something about this new boy that she really liked, and she was pretty sure that the feeling was mutual. As much as Lisa liked Jesse, however, she had to admit that his Falcon was not the most elegant automobile she had ever ridden in. As a matter of fact, she had never seen such a battered and makeshift car before in her whole life. The body of the car was almost as much rust as metal, and the stuffing that stuck up through the front seat inside was barely held in by the cheap tape that covered most of the ripped-up vinyl upholstery. The dashboard was cracked and peeling with gaping holes where the radio and the glove compartment used to be. In lieu of state-of-the-art stereo equipment, a cheap AM transistor radio was hung by its wrist strap like a good luck charm from the rearview mirror. Lisa was beginning to love the old heap almost as much as Jesse did. Jesse climbed into the driver's seat. He pulled a couple of bare wires out from under the dash and twisted them together. Aren't you afraid somebody could steal your car like that? asked Lisa. Are you kidding? said Jesse, turning to the girl with a big smile on his face. This car? He flicked on a toggle switch that stuck out through a crudely drilled hole in the dash and then pushed the button next to it. Slowly, the starter began to turn over. Contact, said Jesse, giving a thumbs-up signal. The engine loudly backfired and then roared to life. He threw the wobbly gear shift into first and stepped on the accelerator as the car began slowly to buck and rumble its way up the street. Jesse glanced at Lisa Paletti and broke into a grin. Bad dreams or no bad dreams, life in Springwood was looking very good indeed. Back at his home, his father was also feeling very pleased with life in the suburbs that morning. Floating on a foam chair in the middle of his small backyard pool, he sipped his coffee and took a deep breath of the fresh morning air. Ken, said his wife, stepping out the back door and glancing at her wristwatch. Shouldn't you be getting to the office? It's almost nine o'clock. As soon as I finish my coffee, he said, I'm enjoying my pool right now. He paused and took a sip of his wife's excellent coffee. I lo just love our new house, don't you? Of course I do, she said, but the look on her face told him that something wasn't quite right. What's the problem, Cheryl? I'll just be a lot happier when you finish taking down those bars, she said. 
Ken looked at the old house and nodded. It was hard to imagine why anyone would put heavy iron bars on every window and door in this lovely old house on Elm Street. Chapter 2 Lisa was glad she had physical education the same time as Jessie. Not that she liked the class or her teacher, Lisa did not happen to share Mrs. Dorfman's archaic notion that archery was an essential element of every girl's physical education. Standing outside in her goofy gym suit and shooting arrows at some dumb target was not Lisa's idea of a good time but at least it gave her the opportunity to watch Jesse and the other boys play softball at the other end of the athletic field. Lisa knew that Jesse really enjoyed softball and looked forward to gym each day, but she liked to think that their friendly exchange of smiles and waves during seventh period every day meant almost as much to him as throwing that big ball around and sliding into the mud. He make any moves yet? Lisa turned to the girl standing next to her and shrugged. I've only known him a few weeks, she told her friend Carrie. Sometimes it was hard to believe that she and Jesse had only met a month ago. As she looked at him now, standing at second base and staring intently at the batter, she couldn't help feeling as if she had known the boy her entire life. Personally, said Carrie, I think that boy needs a push start, <laughs> Lisa laughed. She knew that Carrie had gone pretty far, pretty fast with a lot of guys, but... That just wasn't Lisa's style. Lisa was glad that Jesse wasn't pushing for anything more physical yet. They were still getting to know each other, and for now, it was kind of nice just having him as a good friend. Lisa wondered why things always seemed to get so complicated once you started treating a boy as something more than a friend. Lisa had just slipped an arrow into her bow when she heard the crack of a ball against a bat on the other side of the field. She glanced over to home plate and saw that Ron Grady had just sent the ball flying over the pitcher's head towards second base. She looked over to where Jesse stood and saw that he had chosen that inopportune moment to smile at her and wave. Jesse! she cried, but it was too late. The ball grazed him on the side of the head, and Jesse tumbled to the ground. Immediately, Jesse's teammates were at his side and helping him to his feet. He waved them away more embarrassed than hurt, and glanced over at Lisa to see if she had witnessed his fall. The girl smiled at him and shrugged. You okay? asked Coach Snyder, jogging over from his umpire's position behind home plate. I'm fine, said Jesse. Snyder was an ex-Marine and a real hard character. Jesse had decided from the very beginning to do everything he could to stay on Coach Snyder's good side. "'assuming, of course, that Coach Snyder had a good side. "'Well, pay attention next time,' shouted the coach, "'jogging back across the diamond. "'Jesse resumed his position at second base "'and found himself looking into the sneering face of Ron Grady. "'Maybe you ought to, uh, try something a little more your speed, Walsh,' "'said Grady, taking a few steps toward third base. "'Like, I don't know, uh, knitting.' "'Knit this, Grady.' Jesse stuck out his tongue and gave Grady a particularly juicy Bronx cheer. Grady responded by grabbing his own crotch and making the appropriate obscene gesture. Jesse replied with an Italian salute, slapping one hand into the crook of his arm and throwing up his middle finger for good measure. Grady was about to return the compliment when his teammate slammed a line drive into left field. Grady broke for third but was greeted by the third baseman who now held the ball in his mitt. Grady turned and headed back for second, just as the ball snapped into Jesse's outstretched glove. He turned again, running back and forth like a rat in a trap, as Jesse and the third baseman slowly moved in on their prey. In a desperate attempt to get past Jesse, Grady suddenly slid headfirst into second base, but his attempt proved futile. With a grin of triumph, Jesse swooped down and tagged the runner out. The sportsmanlike thing for Grady to have done at that point would have been to rise to his feet and trot quickly back to the bench. But sportsmanship had never been Ron Grady's strong suit. Instead, he pulled himself to his feet by grabbing onto Jesse's gym shorts and yanking them down to his ankles. 
Jesse looked down and saw himself exposed to the world in his slightly frayed jock strap. Under different circumstances, he might have laughed it off as a prank and planned to take appropriate revenge on Grady at some future date. Knowing that Lisa and her classmates had witnessed this stunt, however, Jesse was furious. He lunged at Grady, tripping over his own shorts as he threw the larger boy to the ground and started trading punches with him. Cute ass, said Carrie from the archery range. Lisa smiled and nodded her head. The fight did not last long. Coach Snyder quickly broke through the crowd of cheering boys to grab Jesse and Grady by their necks. Assume the position, boys, said the ex-Marine, and Jesse knew then and there that fighting in Coach Snyder's class had been a serious mistake. An hour later, Jesse and Grady were still side by side in the center of the baseball diamond. Only now they were in the front-leaning rest position, their elbows slightly bent and their arms aching as each boy held himself up in a painful frozen push-up. How much longer you figure he'll keep us here? asked Jesse, his muscles twitching and his teeth clenched in pain. Could be all night, said Grady, gasping for breath. Guy gets his rocks off like this. I hear he hangs out in, in queer S&M joints downtown, likes, you know, pretty boys like you. Get out of here, said Jesse. He had met a lot of loudmouths like Grady over the years, and he knew that most of them just talked to hear the sound of their own voices. Still, you never knew when one of them was actually telling you the truth. But Grady was tired of talking about the coach. So what about you and that uh, Paletti girl? He asked after a silence that seemed to last for hours. What about it? You two got a thing going or what, man? She's a neighbor, Jesse said a little too quickly. He didn't like talking about Lisa to a guy like Grady. I drive her to school. She giving you any uh, car fare for the ride? Grady asked, a smirk on his face. Under different circumstances, Jesse might have answered with his fist. You got a problem with me, Grady? He sincerely hoped that he wasn't going to have Grady on his case for the rest of the semester. No, nah, said the other boy, looking somewhat surprised by Jesse's question. Just killing time. <coughs> then the whistle blew and Coach Snyder appeared in his street clothes. Okay, boys! he said, already crossing the field in the direction of the faculty parking lot. Hit the showers! Both boys collapsed on the ground, their arms and shoulders screaming with relief. They lay there for a long time before getting up slowly, like two very arthritic old men. Then, their arms dangling loosely at their sides, the two boys staggered toward the locker room. If the coach's intention had been to bring the boys closer together, the severity of his punishment was not without some justification. By the time Jesse and Grady finished their showers, they were bonded together forever by a common hatred for Coach Snyder and his extreme methods of exacting discipline from his students. Uh, so, said Grady, as he slipped into his shirt, you live around here? Not too far, said Jesse. My folks bought a place over on Elm Street. Grady stopped buttoning his shirt and looked up. Elm Street? He echoed. You telling me you moved into that big white house with the bars on the windows? Yeah, why? Grady grinned and shook his head slowly from side to side. Shit, he said. You can tell your old man he's a real chump. What the hell are you talking about? Asked Jesse, his temper flaring once again. They've only been trying to unload that dump for like five years, said Grady. Some chick was locked in there by her mother and she went crazy. Seems she watched her boyfriend get butchered by some maniac in the house across the street. They say her poor drunken mama killed herself right inside your front door. Jesse stared at Grady and tried to decide how much of the story he was making up. Oh, you're full of shit, he said at last, slamming his locker shut and walking away. Still, he couldn't help wondering about those weird bars. Jesse reached the parking lot only to find Lisa Paletti leaning against the Falcon's front fender. You didn't have to wait, he said, although he was very glad that she did. That's okay. Lisa smiled and shrugged her shoulders. I wanted to. Jesse returned the girl's smile and opened the car door. For a moment, he considered kissing her on her pretty mouth and telling her how glad he was to see her. 
Instead, he slid into the car and started the engine. "'Are you okay?' she asked. Jesse looked at himself in the rearview mirror and shrugged. "'I'm fine,' he said, knowing that he didn't look it. An ugly bruise had appeared over his right eye where Grady's fist had landed during their brief scuffle. "'Let me look at that eye,' said Lisa. Jesse tilted his head back, suddenly feeling vaguely proud of his injury. "'You really shouldn't be fighting with that jerk, you know.' "'Grady?' he said, a little surprised by the intensity of Lisa's concern. "'Ah, uh, Grady's all right. He's just a hothead.' "'Uh, don't you mean a shithead?' said Lisa. "'Right,' said Jesse. "'But even a shithead can be right sometimes,' he thought, as he gunned the engine and headed for home.' Chapter 3 Jesse lay in bed, his eyes wide open and his brain working overtime. Not that there was really all that much to think about. Sure, there was Lisa and Grady and school and the coach and the nightmares and a dozen other things that had been on Jesse's mind all day. But there was really nothing Jesse had to think about that couldn't wait until morning. Still, Jesse found himself lying awake, thinking about all those things at once, and there didn't seem to be anything he could do to stop. Jesse had never had trouble sleeping before. In the past, just thinking about going to bed was almost enough to put him out. Now, whatever switch in his brain that was supposed to turn off at night seemed to be permanently stuck in the on position. Jesse turned from one side to the other, fluffed his pillow, and even tried sleeping with his feet propped up on the headboard. But nothing seemed to work. Jesse felt more wide awake than he had all day. Maybe it's the damned heat, he thought, throwing his cover on the floor and sitting up. The problem with the air conditioning was really starting to get seriously out of hand. The temperature in the house must have been at least 20 degrees higher than the temperature outside. And Jesse's room was the hottest of all. Jesse pulled on a pair of pants and walked down to the kitchen. He remembered reading in a magazine about how milk had some kind of enzyme or something in it that helps you sleep. Jesse figured it was probably bullshit, like most of the stuff in those magazines, but he didn't see how it could hurt to try. Besides, he had to do something besides lie in bed and stare at that damn ceiling all night. It was dark in the kitchen, but Jesse wasn't quite ready to face the blinding glare of the overhead light. Guided by the moonlight that shone faintly through the window, he found his way to the refrigerator, the linoleum cold beneath his bare feet. Now, the last thing anyone expects when opening the refrigerator door in the middle of the night is for something to jump out at him and land at his feet with the resounding crash, which is why Jesse almost had heart failure when the bottle of apple juice flung itself out of the refrigerator and shattered on the kitchen floor. Take it easy, Walsh, he told himself, quickly regaining his composure. He glanced out into the hall, hoping that the noise hadn't disturbed anyone upstairs. He was in no mood to have his father come downstairs and bawl him out for breaking the apple juice bottle in the middle of the night, especially when he never even touched the damn bottle. Jesse crossed the room and unrolled an absurd length of paper toweling from the roll over the sink. All I need now is a handful of broken glass, he thought, tearing off an extra half dozen sheets for good measure. He had just finished cleaning up when he saw the grotesque face in the kitchen window. Shit! He whispered, turning his head away for just a moment. When he looked back, the face was gone. One thing worse than having something jump out of your refrigerator in the middle of the night is to see a grotesque face leering in at you through your kitchen window. And one thing worse than that is having the face disappear a split second later. Jesse figured he had two choices. He could assume that his eyes were playing tricks on him and just go back to bed, or he could go outside and find out who or what was staring into his kitchen window in the middle of the night. Taking a deep breath to quiet his pounding heart, Jesse reluctantly chose the second course of action. His palms sweating, he opened the back door and stepped outside. Silence. Not even a cricket chirp to disturb the absolute quiet of the night. Jesse opened the gate and checked out the side of the house. He thought he saw something move in the shrubbery. Suddenly, he had an idea of who the intruder might be. 
Grady? He whispered loudly, taking one cautious step closer to the shrubbery. It better be you, you son of a bitch. Jesse was about to pounce on the bush when he heard the sound of ripping wood. Quickly, Jesse moved to the side of the house and saw the flickering orange light emanating from the cellar window. He got down on his hands and knees and peered inside. The man in the cellar was definitely not Ron Grady. Grady didn't wear a filthy red and green striped sweater and a battered fedora hat, and Grady would definitely not put his hand into a raging furnace. Holy shit, said Jesse, as the man pulled a bundle of rags out of the furnace and began to unwrap them. Holy shit, he said again, unable to think of anything more original to say under the circumstances. He raced back through the gate and into the house, heading directly for the cellar door. The door was wide open, the wooden frame around the lock splintered as if by some crowbar. Jesse peeked inside, almost deafened by the roar of the furnace. Then he saw the intruder's eerie shadow on the cellar walls, and he knew for sure that this was a problem he didn't want to handle by himself. Dad! he screamed, slamming the cellar door closed and throwing all his weight against it. Dad! He screamed again. Something inside began pounding against the door, a force far stronger than Jesse, slowly inching it open. Jesse let go and bolted toward the foyer, but there was no escape. The man in the dirty sweater was blocking his way, an evil smile on his scarred face. Daddy can't help you now, he croaked, flashing his steel blades in Jesse's face. Jesse turned to run, but the man with the finger knives had already grabbed him with the vice-like grip and lifted him several inches off the floor. I've been waiting five years for you, Jesse, he said, his talons touching the boy's cheek, almost like the gentle fingers of a lover. We've got special work to do, you and me. Things are really gonna heat up now. Jesse struggled to get free, but it was no use. He turned his face to the side, as disgusted by the madman's foul breath as he was terrified of his razor-sharp blades. We'll do real good together, you and me, the man said, before suddenly hurling Jesse against the wall. He grinned, exposing a mouthful of crooked yellow teeth. You got the body, he said, raising his left hand to the brim of his hat. And I got the brains. He took off his hat, and Jesse saw that the top of his skull was completely gone. Beneath the hat was a bloody, pulsating mass of exposed brain matter. Jesse began to scream, and he was still screaming when his mother and father came running into the bedroom to wake him up. Maybe we should call a doctor, said his mother, holding the boy in her arms as he sat up in bed, trembling and drenched in sweat. I'm okay, said Jesse. He shook his head violently from side to side in a struggle to regain full consciousness. It, it was just a bad dream. Just a bad dream, he repeated to himself, wanting desperately to believe it. Chapter 4 If Jesse had found it hard to fall asleep that night, he was finding it even more difficult to stay awake the following afternoon. Even under the best of circumstances, Mr. Abel was not the sort of biology teacher who inspired students to dissect their frogs with unbounded enthusiasm or run to their guidance counselors to investigate careers in the biological sciences. More often, students who entered Mr. Abel's class with a burning interest in biology ended the semester by vowing never to take another science course for the rest of their natural lives. The subject of today's lecture was the digestive system, and Jesse was finding it more difficult with every passing moment to keep his eyes open. He had not enjoyed an unbroken night's sleep for weeks, and the sound of Mr. Abel's droning voice was proving to be just the sort of bland background noise that Jesse needed to lull himself to sleep. To review 
said Mr. Abel, reading as always from the same notes he had been reading to students since landing his first teaching job many years ago. The solid waste, those nutrients that are not absorbed in the lining of the stomach, the large intestine, or the small intestine, that is, the alimentary canal, are passed out through the colon. Someone in the back of the room did an excellent impression of gas passing loudly through the human colon. Mr. Abel looked up and waited for the laughter to subside. The liquid nutrients, he continued, untroubled by his students' complete lack of interest, are then carried through an elaborate system of filtering, aided by the pancreas, liver, and the gallbladder. Jesse sat with his chin in his hand, his eyelids at half-mast, as the teacher droned on and on. He was not aware that Ron Grady was watching him from across the room. Or collected in the bladder to be expelled at a later time, Mr. Abel continued. And this entire process is kept moving through the circulatory system, the center of which is the heart. Mr. Abel paused dramatically, reached under his lab table, and plunked down the bloody heart of a calf. "'Gross!' cried a girl in the front row, and she was clearly not alone in her opinion. Mr. Abel treated the class to one of his rare smiles. This was his favorite part of the semester. Except, of course, for the day they dissected the fetal pig. Someone almost always passed out before that day was over. Four chambers, he explained, using his index finger as a pointer, slipping it into each bloody chamber with great enthusiasm. Just like the human heart, from the body through the right auricle to the right ventricle, and out the pulmonary artery to the lungs. At that moment, Jesse was the only student in the room who was not completely grossed out by the teacher's revolting demonstration and that was only because the boy was fast asleep, which was also the reason that he was unaware of the slithery serpent that had wrapped itself around his arm and was slowly making its way toward his face. It was not until the snake hissed and tickled his arm with its long forked tongue that Jesse opened his eyes and screamed, scrambling out of his seat while prying the reptile off of his arm. In an instant, Mr. Abel was at the boy's side, he plucked the snake expertly off Jesse's arm and dropped it into the nearby tank, from which someone had quietly removed it. If you want to play with animals, Mr. Walsh, said the teacher, may I suggest you join the circus? Jesse felt himself flush with embarrassment as the class broke out in laughter and applause. He looked around and saw Ron Grady grinning at him from his seat next to the reptile tank. Jesse had all but forgotten the incident in biology by the time seventh period rolled around. Tonight he was going to be with Lisa, and nothing a jerk like Grady could do was going to put a permanent damper on his high spirits. It was unbearably warm in Jesse's room as he pulled his pants on over his bathing suit, but Jesse barely noticed the heat. Tonight promised to be the night that he and Lisa finally became more than just good friends. Jessie had been trying to work up the courage to ask her out all week, but somehow the time just never seemed right. He had planned to make his move at the big pool party Lisa was throwing at the end of the week and hoped he wouldn't lose his nerve when the right moment presented itself. Fortunately, Lisa had taken the matter into her own hands. When he mentioned that he was looking forward to the party, Lisa asked him if he wanted to come over tonight for a sneak preview. The invitation was rife with possibilities. Unfortunately, his father had different plans for Jesse that evening. "'Where do you think you're going?' asked Ken Walsh, as his son bounced merrily down the stairs with the rolled towel under his arm. "'Just out for a while,' said Jesse. He wasn't ready to tell his father about Lisa Paletti just yet. "'Didn't I tell you I want that room unpacked tonight?' asked his father, shouting to make himself heard over six o'clock news. "'Oh, come on, Dad,' 
said Jesse, looking at his mother for sympathy and support. Upstairs, ordered his father. Jesse's mother was about to speak when her husband fixed her with a withering gaze. Now, he said, and the boy knew there was no use arguing. Cursing in a voice too low to be heard, he turned around and stomped back up the stairs. A minute later, a telephone rang at the Paletti house on the other end of Elm Street. There's a Jesse on the phone, Mrs. Paletti informed her daughter, sticking her head out through the sliding glass doors that led to the pool. Thanks, Mom. Lisa hoisted herself out of the pool, threw a towel around her shoulders, and picked up the wireless phone on the poolside table. Jesse, hi. Oh, that's okay. Well, I'm sorry you can't make it. No, I understand. Parents can be real pains. I'll see you in the morning, okay? Jesse hung up the phone and threw himself down on the bed. So he wouldn't be going swimming with Lisa tonight. Big deal. He'd have plenty of time to be alone with her at the party. Besides, he was still going to see her in the morning, and that was certainly something to feel good about. Having convinced himself that the world was not coming to an end, Jesse sat up and surveyed the room that he was now obliged to put into some semblance of order. It was clearly going to be no easy task. Jesse had decided long ago that no unpleasant chore should ever be undertaken until the proper musical accompaniment had been chosen. He pulled a shoebox out of one of the many open cartons surrounding the bed and rifled through his collection of cassettes. He picked out one of the tapes, popped it into his cassette player, and turned up the volume. Ooh, you know how to love me, yeah. When we make love tonight. Jesse wondered how anyone ever got anything done before the invention of rock and roll. There was something about the pounding of the drums and the driving rhythm of the guitars that never failed to make his feet start to move and his heart start to pump just a little bit faster. Tired though he was, Jesse was on his feet now, shuffling along in time to the music as he started randomly dumping his contents of cartons directly into his bureau drawers. Humming along with the music, he pulled a pair of wraparound sunglasses out of a box and put them on. He danced across the room and found his Stetson, pulling the big old cowboy hat down low over his eyes. There was a searing lead guitar solo on the tape now, and Jesse danced over to the mirror, miming a brilliant air guitar riff. Looking good, he told himself, swinging over to the desk in time to the driving beat of the music. He picked up a box of pencils and assorted school supplies and dumped them unceremoniously into the desk drawer just as the drum solo began. Jesse snatched up a pair of unsharpened pencils and laid down some flawless paradiddles on the edge of the desk. Delighted by his own spectacular aptitude as a drummer, Jesse shoved the two pencils up his nostrils, tucked his thumbs under his armpits, and began flapping his elbows joyously in time to the music. Jesse's funky chicken, he said out loud, spinning around in a perfect imitation of James Brown, the godfather of soul, at his absolute funkiest. He had just completed the spin when he saw Lisa and his mother standing in the doorway. Jesse's mother was knocking timidly on the open door as Jesse yanked the pencils out of his nose and turned off the tape player. He glanced at himself in the mirror and pulled off the sunglasses and the Stetson hat. Uh, hi, he said, trying very hard to sound as if he had not just been caught acting like a total fool, a total funky chicken. Hi, said Lisa. Jesse looked pointedly at his mother. The woman sighed deeply and went downstairs. I told your mom that you invited me over said Lisa, staring with wide eyes at Jesse's pigsty of a room as she stepped inside. I guess I should have called first? No, no, that's okay, said Jesse as he threw the pencils into the desk drawer. I was just unpacking. I know. Lisa glanced casually into one of the many open cartons on the floor. I figured you might like some help. Yeah? Lisa shrugged her shoulders and smiled. What are friends for, right? she asked, pushing back her sleeves as she started to unload the largest carton in the room. After half an hour of unpacking, 
Jesse thought that his room looked almost like one of those flawless teenage rooms that he had seen on reruns of old TV sitcoms. In fact, although the room was still very far from what Jesse's father would consider to be straightened up, Jesse and Lisa had undeniably taken a few major steps in the right direction. Jesse was busy positioning his baseball trophy in a conspicuous spot on the corner of his dresser when Lisa pulled an aerosol can of jock itch spray out of a carton. And where does this go? she asked, a mischievous smile on her face. His face reddening slightly, Jesse grabbed the can away from her and stashed it out of sight behind his trophy. He looked around for some more suitable unpacking for the girl to do. Uh, there's a box of sweaters over there if you want to put them away, he said. Lisa nodded and dragged the box closer to the closet. She grabbed a handful of sweaters, folded them neatly, and then stepped up onto a chair to stack them on the upper shelf. She was about to step down when she noticed a small leather-bound book in the back corner of the shelf. What's this? she asked, handing the small red book to Jesse. Uh, looks like a diary. He casually fingered the leather strap that snapped into a small metal latch on the front. Lisa took the book back and sat down at Jesse's desk chair. She glanced at the boy for a moment and then opened the latch. When Jesse didn't object, she opened the book and began to read out loud. Nancy Thompson, 323 Elm Street. Hey, this thing is five years old. Jesse stepped forward and looked over Lisa's shoulder. You know her? he asked. Before my time, said Lisa with a shake of her head. I just moved here three years ago myself. Lisa flipped a few pages and resumed reading. February 17th, my birthday. Daddy came by today with a big old stuffed bear for me. He took me to dinner and a movie. When we got back, he and Mother had another one of their fights. He left angry. I wish they would stop fighting. Jesse went back to unpacking, clearly uninterested in the problems of some girl who lived here five years ago. I think it's sad said Lisa, continuing to leaf through the pages of the diary. Traumas of a ten-year-old, said Jesse, wondering to himself why girls were so fascinated by that sort of thing. March 7th, Lisa read, her voice slightly louder now as if to command Jesse's attention. Glenn asked me to sleep with him again. Jesse stopped what he was doing and started paying attention. I can't yet, the diary continued. I like him and I want to make him happy, but I'm not sure that I love him. I can't sleep with someone I don't love. That's typical, said Jesse, suddenly extremely aware that he was alone with Lisa in his bedroom. I hope she didn't expect to make the bestseller list with this thing. Lisa ignored him and continued scanning the pages. Listen to this, she said. Sometimes when I'm lying here in bed, I can see Glenn across the way getting ready for bed. His body is slim and smooth. I know I shouldn't watch, but that part of me that wants him forces me to. That's when I weaken. That's when I want to go to him. Jesse strode quickly across the room and took the book from Lisa. He reread the passage and then turned the page, with a disappointed look on his face. That's it? he said, flipping through the pages. Wait, she skipped a week. He looked at Lisa for a moment and then read out loud. March 15th. He comes to me at night, horrible, ugly, dirty, under the sheets with me, tearing at my nightgown with his steel claw. Jesse paused. There was something about the steel claw. He keeps taking me to the boiler room. He wants to kill me. Jesse turned the page, and suddenly his hands began to tremble. What is it? asked Lisa. Jesse handed her the book. There was one sentence scrawled across the page. Tina is dead. Jesse took the book back and read the next page aloud. Rod's been killed. He got Rod. There's just Glenn and me now. Mustn't fall asleep. Are you okay? asked Lisa, alarmed as much by the expression on Jesse's face as by the weird diary entries. It's just something Grady told me today, said Jesse about the people that lived here before? He said the girl went crazy after she saw her boyfriend get killed across the street. 
Lisa was about to tell him what she thought about Ron Grady and his stupid stories when Jessie's mother walked in. How's it going? she asked cheerfully. Okay, said Jessie, hiding the diary behind his back. He wasn't quite ready to talk to his mother about the strange book or about Grady's spooky story. It looks great in here, said his mother, smiling as she surveyed the room. I thought you kids might like to take a break. I've got some cold cider downstairs. Lisa glanced at Jessie's alarm clock and shook her head. Thanks, she said, but I'd better be going. I've got a major paper due at the end of the week. Let me know if you change your mind, said Jessie's mother before leaving the room. There was something about this girl that she really liked. Jessie waited until his mother was gone before turning back to Lisa. You sure you have to go? he asked. I'm afraid so, she replied. World history, but I'll see you in the morning, right? Jessie smiled and nodded his head. Let me know how that thing turns out, okay? said Lisa, pointing to the diary. Jesse looked down at the book that he still clenched tightly in his hand. His fingers had left a deep indentation in the diary's soft leather binding. Chapter 5 It's kind of warm in here, isn't it? Jessie's mother had just finished covering the parakeet cage, as she did every evening around that time. She didn't like to complain, but she had never seen birds sweat before. Ken Walsh glared at his wife and wiped the perspiration off his forehead. She had been after him for the past several days to do something about the air conditioning, and now it was unbearably warm in the house. Ken hated to be proved wrong about anything especially in front of Angela and Jesse, but he had to admit to himself that he had waited a little too long to put in the damned Freon. He climbed out of his recliner and walked over to the thermostat near the kitchen door. It's 97 degrees in here! He immediately pulled the cover plate off the thermostat and began fiddling with the coil. He wasn't exactly sure what he was doing, but Ken Walsh was a man who believed that it was always better to be doing something than not to be doing anything at all. Jesse was aware of the intense heat the moment he walked in the room. It was warm throughout the house, but the heat was especially oppressive in the living room that evening. He was about to ask his father when he planned to do something about the air conditioning when Angela raised an index finger to her lips. Shh, she said. The birds are sleeping. Jesse never cared much for Mr. Blue and Mr. Green, and Angela knew it. She had been the one who wanted parakeets in the first place and she had been the one to come up with their ridiculous names. Jessie used to tease her by insisting that the blue parakeet was actually Mr. Green and vice versa, but they both quickly tired of that game. Now Jessie generally just ignored the creatures altogether. They were quiet birds who required nothing more in the way of daily care than a little bird seed, some fresh water, and a clean layer of newspaper on the bottom of their cage. Mr. Blue and Mr. Green were the kind of pets that were easy to ignore, at least until that night. The first terrifying squawk that came from within the covered cage sounded as if it were filtered through a guitar amplifier that someone had accidentally turned up all the way. Jesse rushed to the cage and tore away the cover. Mr. Blue had pierced Mr. Green's neck with his sharp beak and was proceeding to rip the green bird to shreds with his claws. Without thinking, Jesse opened the cage and reached inside to separate the attacking bird from his victim. Mr. Blue immediately turned his attention to the intruding hand, drawing blood from Jesse's wrist before flying out into the living room. Angela screamed as the bird circled over her head, sounding a loud war cry that seemed more appropriate for an eagle than a parakeet. Suddenly, the bird swooped down, diving directly at Jesse's father. Ken Walsh screamed in pain as Mr. Blue cut a bloody gash just below his left eye. Get a broom or something! He yelled as the bird crashed into a lamp and sent it crashing to the floor. Maybe it was just the excitement of the moment, but Jesse would have sworn that the parakeet had somehow grown to the size of a small pigeon hawk. The bird was hovering around the light fixture now, its beak and most of its head covered with blood. 
Jesse's mother had handed her husband a broom, and he began swatting wildly at the fast-moving bird. Suddenly, Mr. Blue let out a terrifying scream and dove for Jesse's head. Jesse ducked just before his father swung the broom, knocking over the other lamp as the bird soared back toward the ceiling. It seemed to be puffing up even larger now, and a low growl hissed from its throat. Angela wrapped herself tightly around her mother's leg and whimpered in terror as the demonic bird looked around to select its next victim. Then there was a loud explosion, and Mr. Blue burst into flames in midair. Angela was still crying hysterically as her father dashed into the kitchen with a screwdriver and a pipe wrench in his hands. Jesse watched as the man threw his full weight against the gas range and tried to pull the heavy appliance away from the wall. Help me with this thing, he said, glaring angrily at Jesse. It's not the gas, Dad, said Jesse. Don't tell me it's not the gas, said his father, beads of perspiration dripping into the bloody gash below his eye. Your mother thought she smelled gas. I wasn't sure, Ken, said Jesse's mother timidly. All right, then, he said, banging a fist on the range. What is it? Bird rabies? That cheap seed you've been buying, there's got to be an explanation. Animals don't just burst into flames for no reason. Well, it sure isn't leaky gas pipes, said Jesse. He hated it when his father acted so irrationally. Why did he always think there was an easy answer to every single problem? Ken Walsh straightened his back and cracked his head on the edge of the range hood. Clutching his head with one hand and groaning in pain, he whirled around and pointed an accusing finger at Jesse. You set this whole thing up, didn't you? He said, a gleam of sudden revelation in his eye. This is one of your sick jokes, isn't it? Oh, Ken, said his wife in disgust. You know what I'm talking about. He lifted his wrench to shoulder level and took a step closer to Jesse. What did you use, a firecracker? Some kind of cherry bomb? Jesse shook his head, refusing to believe that his father could even think of accusing him of such a thing. I don't have to listen to this, he said, storming angrily out of the kitchen. You come back here, yelled his father, but Jesse was already halfway up the stairs. Ken Walsh stared blankly at the pipe wrench in his trembling hand, before turning to his sad-eyed wife. I don't know, Cheryl, he said, taking her in his arms. He used to be such a good kid. Sleep came easily to Jesse the night Mr. Blue exploded. Between parakeets bursting into flame and the incredible stuff he had been reading in Nancy Thompson's diary, Jesse figured that going to sleep was the only sensible thing to do if he wanted to hold on to his sanity until morning. If I think about all this stuff tonight, I'll go nuts, he thought as he climbed into bed and turned off the lights. Jesse pulled the cover up over his head and closed his eyes, confident that things would begin to make more sense after a good night's sleep. It was a good plan, but it didn't work out exactly the way he had hoped. Shortly after two o'clock in the morning, Jesse emerged from his room and stepped lightly past his parents' bedroom. He went downstairs into the dark foyer and paused for a long moment at the cellar door. There was something Jesse had to do, but he knew that doing it was going to change his life forever. Jesse wasn't sure he wanted his life to change, not now, and certainly not like that. Do it, he whispered aloud, reviving his rapidly failing courage. He took a deep breath, opened the door, and turned on the light. Slowly, he climbed down the stairs and approached the furnace. He squatted down, reached past the door, and pulled out a heavy object wrapped in a bundle of dirty old rags. And then the furnace switched on with a deafening roar, and flames filled the iron firebox. Hot enough for you? Jesse whirled around and saw the man in the red and green sweater leaning up against the cellar wall. Go ahead, Jesse. Do it. The man croaked, nodding his head at the obscene object in Jesse's hand. Try it on. For size. Jesse looked at the glove and saw that the dull and rusty blades were now razor sharp and gleaming in the dim light. What do you want? 
Jesse demanded, instantly dropping the glove on the cellar floor. The man in the dirty sweater looked down at the gleaming blades and then turned his hateful gaze on Jesse for just a fraction of a second. Then his eyes softened again and his mouth twisted into the vague semblance of a smile. I need you to finish my work! Just let me teach you, Jesse. Oh, we'll have fun. You liked my little trick with the birds, didn't you? Jesse stepped behind a stack of cartons as the man slowly moved toward him. Kill for me, he said, his voice almost seductive now as he stepped closer to the terrified boy. Come on, Jesse! Come to Freddy! No, I won't! screamed Jesse. He whirled around, knocking over the stack of cartons as he dashed wildly toward the cellar steps. He only got halfway up when he missed his footing and slipped tumbling head first down the stairs. When he came to, he was alone. The furnace was off and Freddy was gone. Only the finger knives remained, as shiny and new as the day they were made. No one was talking about Mr. Blue and Mr. Green at breakfast the next morning. In fact, no one was talking at all. Ken and Shirley Walsh were staring into their coffee cups and picking at some slices of dry toast, while Angela used the corner of her waffle to draw little circles in a small puddle of imitation maple syrup. Then Jesse came into the kitchen and poured himself a cup of hot black coffee. Why did it take them five years to sell the house, Dad? he asked, sitting directly opposite his father at the table. His father looked at Jesse with surprise for just a second, and then looked away. I don't know, he said, shrugging his shoulders. I guess they couldn't get the right price. And I suppose you don't know anything about a murder across the street, and a crazy girl who lived here who saw the whole thing? I don't know, said his father, still avoiding Jesse's eyes. I guess they told me something about it, what difference does it make? Ken Walsh felt his wife's eyes on his neck and looked up at her. Come on, Cheryl, he said, his tone halfway between anger and apology. How do you think we got such a good deal? Listen, all the old houses have stories. Did they tell you that she went totally out of her mind? Asked Jesse, speaking to his mother now as well as to his father. That they had to put her away? Did they tell you that, that her mother killed herself in our living room? There was a moment of silence, and then Jesse realized that his sister had started to cry. Mommy, I'm scared, said Angela, turning her moist eyes to her mother. It's all right, sweetheart, the woman replied, taking her daughter in her arms. Daddy and Jesse are just making believe, okay? She tightened her hold on Angela and gave Jesse a hard look. I don't think we should be talking about this now. You see what you're doing, said Jesse's father. You've upset your sister with all this talk. I don't want to hear another word about it. There's nothing wrong with this house. Jesse was about to tell his father about the glove in the cellar when his mother started sniffing the air. Is something burning? she asked. Jesse turned and saw that the toaster on the countertop was glowing red hot. Suddenly, flames shot out of the slots, scorching the ceiling and the wallpaper behind the counter. Jesse's father was on his feet a second later, beating out the fire with a dish towel. When the fire was out, he turned away from the smoldering toaster and tossed the burnt towel in the sink. Craziest thing I ever saw, he said, staring in bewilderment at the charred cord that hung limply from the side of the toaster. The damn thing wasn't even plugged in. Jesse took one more sip of coffee and then left without saying goodbye. Chapter 6 This is amazing, said Lisa, studying the talon-tipped glove that Jesse had recovered from the cellar that morning. She was sitting next to Jesse in the Falcon and finishing off the remains of a fast-food breakfast. Your dream told you where this was? 
Jesse sipped his coffee and nodded. Only it was more like sleepwalking, he said. All I know is I woke up on the cellar floor and there it was. He reached into his knapsack and pulled out the leather-bound diary. I couldn't get back to sleep, so I stayed up all night reading this thing. It really gets crazy toward the end after all the death stuff. What? Even crazier? said Lisa, popping a french fry into her mouth. Well, listen to this, said Jessie. It seems her mother took her down to the basement and showed her the glove. That's when she found out about Fred Krueger. Who's Fred Krueger? The guy in her dreams. It, it seems he was a real guy who went around killing kids about 15 years ago. Maybe you were having a premonition or something, said Lisa. You know, like those, uh, those guys who help the police solve crimes and find missing people? Anything like this ever happened to you before? Not really. Is that what you think? You think that's what it is? Could be. Anyway, don't worry about it. That diary would give anybody nightmares, Jesse. I guess, said Jesse, already starting to feel a little bit better. Obviously, there was a logical explanation for all of this. All Jesse had to do was figure out what in the hell it could possibly be. Jesse was trying not to think about his dream that afternoon as he stepped up to bat at baseball practice. Lisa had asked to borrow the diary and Jesse was confident that she would somehow make sense out of the whole crazy situation. Besides, there were other things on his mind that were already beginning to seem more important than some weird dream. Like the fact that Lisa had kissed him goodbye for the first time that morning. It wasn't Jesse's first kiss. He had gone steady with the girl last year and she and Jesse had done a lot more than just kiss before the relationship had ended. Still, there was something about Lisa's kiss that morning that made Jesse feel as if no girl had ever really kissed him before. It was a kiss that promised things to come, that would go far beyond anything Jesse had ever experienced in his 17 years. Strike two! yelled Snyder, rudely interrupting Jesse's reverie. He turned around and looked at the coach for a second, before adjusting his stance and choking up on the bat. He hadn't even noticed the first strike. Jesse looked down the baseline and saw that the runner on third was Ron Grady. He knew by the expression on Grady's face that the boy had no expectation of being driven home while Jesse was at bat. I think I'll surprise him, thought Jesse, focusing his complete attention on the ball in the pitcher's hand. He watched the ball coming at him now, his mind on nothing but the point of contact between the fast-moving sphere and the bat in his hand. He connected with a solid crack, slamming the ball past the pitcher and reaching first base, just as great he touched home plate to score the winning run. You hit that ball pretty good, Walsh, said Grady in the locker room after practice. It was okay, said Jesse modestly. Everyone on the team had congratulated him on his playing that afternoon, but hearing it from a guy like Ron Grady was an unexpected bonus. Who told you to choke up that way? asked Grady as he finished buttoning his shirt. My dad, said Jesse. He played in the minors for a while, uh, whenever he got out of college. No shit, said Grady, genuinely impressed. Jesse shrugged and finished dressing. He wasn't sure that a guy like Grady could ever really be anybody's friend but it sure would be nice not to have him as an enemy. Schneider shouldn't have called you out on that double, said Jesse, recalling one of several bad calls the coach had made that afternoon. Yeah, said Grady. Snyder's got a stick up his ass today. Jesse laughed. <laughs> Snyder's always got a stick up his ass, he said, and Grady nodded in agreement. Of course, the conversation might have taken a whole different turn if either boy had heard Snyder enter the room a few moments earlier. By the time Jesse met Lisa in the nearly deserted parking lot, he and Grady had spent a very long and very painful hour running laps around the athletic field. I'm sorry, Lisa, 
Jesse said, still gasping for breath as he leaned next to the girl on the Falcon's dented fender. Oh, Snyder did it to me again. I just got here myself, said Lisa, shrugging off Jesse's lateness, as she gestured toward the stack of books piled up beside her. I've been at the library all afternoon. Cut four classes. Jesse glanced at the books for a second, and then looked back at Lisa. What's all this, Lisa? Research, she replied. She smiled at him and then gave him a quick kiss. Let's go for a ride and I'll tell you all about it. They were driving down a country road that Jesse had never seen before, when Lisa started leafing through one of the books on her lap. I'm convinced that you had a genuine psychic vision, she said, ignoring Jesse's skeptical look. At first I wasn't so sure because you said you never had anything like that happen to you before, but it says in this book that almost everyone has the potential to tune into the other world, even though most people never do. It has something to do with the environment, like they have to be in a place that's sending signals. Like a haunted house? asked Jesse. The girl gave him a look that made Jesse wish he had kept his comment to himself. Sorry, Lisa, but I just don't believe in ghosts. You don't have to, she said. You just have to believe in energy. You've got electricity in your body, don't you? Sure, Jesse remembered Mr. Abel's lecture on the central nervous system. Neurons, synapses, and all that stuff, yeah? And heat and chemical reactions, too. Where do you think it all goes when you die, Jesse? I don't know, said Jesse with a shrug. This wasn't the sort of thing he had ever given much thought to. Into the air? Make a left at the intersection, said Lisa. Jesse followed her instructions as she continued her lecture. What about essential energy? What about the soul? Does that go into the air, too? Do you think there's good energy and bad energy? I don't know, said Jesse, confused by Lisa's weird questions. Where are we going anyway? Park over there and I'll show you, said Lisa, pointing at an old burnt out building that had suddenly appeared from nowhere. Okay, what is this place? asked Jesse. He stepped out of the car, walked past the no trespassing sign that dangled from a rusty chain between two iron poles and read some of the graffiti that was scrawled across the building's many boarded-up windows. Remember the diary? said Lisa, grinning with excitement. Remember how Nancy kept finding herself in a boiler room? Yeah, so? So I did some research on our old friend Fred Krueger, and this is where he worked, in this old power plant. Jesse stared at Lisa in disbelief as she handed him photocopies of local newspaper headlines that she had found in the library. Kruger freed on technicality. DA resigns. Justice done. Kruger killed by mob. Springwood slasher dies in hellish inferno. Holy shit, said Jesse. He looked up and saw that Lisa had already climbed over the rotting boards that once blocked the entrance to the old generating plant. He quickly followed her and found himself inside a huge boiler room. He kidnapped 20 kids and brought them all here to die, said Lisa looking around as if expecting to see the rotting bodies. There was a long silence before she spoke again. Well? Well what? Do you feel anything? What do you mean? asked Jessie. I thought you might be able to make a connection. Jessie looked at her and smiled. Any ghost in here? Hello, any ghost? If you're a ghost, please, hello? He shouted, his voice echoing in the large deserted building. Cut it out, said Lisa. She sounded annoyed and just a little bit frightened. Well, what am I supposed to do, Lise? I don't know, Lisa admitted. Concentrate on something. Jesse stared at the ceiling for a moment and then closed his eyes. I feel like a jerk, he said. Just concentrate, she whispered. Jesse began walking around in a small circle. His eyes shut tight. Anything? Asked Lisa. Jesse shook his head. Then he heard a faint scratching noise. Wait, he said. He walked slowly across the room toward the mesh iron stairway that led up to the catwalk. He reached out his hand to the board that was leaning up against the bottom step and touched it lightly. Jesse? Whispered Lisa, her hand shaking on his shoulder as he yanked the board away. A large black rat snarled from its nest beneath the staircase 
and Jesse and Lisa ran for the doorway as fast as their legs would carry them. A minute later, they were sitting on a boulder near a clump of shade trees a few yards away from the old power plant. Disappointed? asked Jesse when he had finally caught his breath. Disappointed? About not finding any boogeymen. I'll get over it, Lisa smiled, but Jesse sensed that she really was feeling let down. He moved closer to her, his thigh now resting against hers. Anyway, we proved that you're sensitive, she said. You sensed that that rat was there, didn't you? And I can feel something about you. Sometimes I feel like I know what you're thinking. Do you? said Jesse, grinning broadly as he put his arm around the girl's shoulder. Maybe it only happens when you're sleeping, said Lisa, snuggling up a little closer. That's the way it was with Nancy, wasn't it? Now there's an idea, said Jesse. Maybe we should drive out to the beach tonight and lay out a couple of blankets and see what happens when I fall asleep. Lisa smiled and caressed the hand that rested on her shoulder. Maybe we should, she said, her voice very soft. Strictly for science, of course. Oh, of course, said Jesse, his lips now almost touching hers. If you're sure you wouldn't mind being out on the beach with a potential lunatic... Ghostbusters are fearless, whispered Lisa. Then they were in each other's arms, and this time the kiss was for real. Jesse felt the blood pounding in his temples as Lisa pressed her body tightly against his, her tongue hungrily exploring the inside of his mouth. This was the kind of kiss Jesse had waited for all of his life, and Lisa was the girl he had always dreamed it would happen with. He slid his hand underneath her shirt and was thrilled to find that she offered no resistance. And then he pulled away, an agonized expression on his face. What is it? asked Lisa. Jesse just shook his head and groaned. His forehead was throbbing and his skin felt as if someone had set it on fire. He had never felt anything this intense before in his entire life. Every part of his body from the soles of his feet to his tingling fingertips, had suddenly begun to hurt all at once. It was almost as if his total being were undergoing some sort of bizarre transformation. It's gone now, he said, the pain suddenly subsiding abruptly as it had begun. Oh, Jesse, said Lisa, throwing her arms around the boy and holding him close. You definitely are going to have to get some sleep. Jesse stared at the old power plant and nodded his head. He wondered if he would ever sleep again. Chapter 7 It was another unbearably hot night in the Walsh house. Jesse heard thunder in the distance as the storm was moving in. As he tossed and turned in bed, sweat pouring down his body while he struggled in vain to find a comfortable position. Might as well read for a while, he thought, reaching out to switch on the lamp at his side of the bed. He touched the lamp and abruptly pulled his hand back in pain. The switch was red hot, and the plastic lampshade was beginning to melt. Jesse sat up and looked around. The room was literally hot as a furnace. On his bookshelf, a candle had melted into a sticky pool of wax. The laminated shelf on which the candle stood was bubbling gently, and a record he had left out the night before was hanging limply over the edge like something out of the Dali painting his art teacher had shown the class last week. And where was that annoying scraping sound coming from? Jesse stood up and cautiously followed the sound to his desk drawer. He put his hand on the drawer pull and took a deep breath. The last thing in the world I want to see right now is another rat, he thought. Then he opened the drawer and found out that he was wrong. The last thing in the world he wanted to see right then was Fred Krueger's glove, its fingers moving independently, scraping little cuts in the bottom of the desk drawer. He slammed the drawer shut and listened to the sound of his own heart beating. And then he became aware of another noise off in the distance. Swish, thump, swish, thump. Jesse slipped into his jeans and stepped out into the hallway. The sound was coming from Angela's room. He pushed the door open and gazed inside. Angela was in the middle of the room jumping rope and chanting. She looked at Jesse, smiled weirdly, 
and continued jumping and chanting without missing a beat. Jesse slammed the door and ran down the stairs. He went into the kitchen and looked out the window. There was a serious thunderstorm raging outside with the strange bluish lightning that was almost too bright to look at. Jesse clapped his hands over his ears as the sky itself seemed to split open. A multiple flash of lightning followed by the loudest clap of thunder he had ever heard. And then a bolt of lightning shattered the kitchen window, zigzagging its way across the room to destroy a pile of dishes that had been left on the counter overnight. Jesse stared in horror as a plume of black smoke rose from the spot where the dishes had stood just moments before. That bolt was meant for me, he thought, dashing out the door and into the street. It was still pouring outside, but Jesse was no longer on the familiar streets of Springwood. He was in the heart of the inner city now, walking down some dark, deserted street that he had never seen before. There was a dim street light on the corner, and beneath the light was a seedy-looking bar. Jesse went in. The bar was packed with the most degenerate assortment of characters Jesse had ever imagined. Prostitutes and their pimps were soliciting business from the drunks at the bar while a gang of motorcycle toughs in leather and chains hassled a pair of transvestites in the back booth. Jesse ignored an obscene gesture from a grossly obese hooker and sat down at the bar. The bartender glanced at Jesse and drew him a cold beer. Jesse nodded in appreciation and reached for the glass. A large hand slapped down on his wrist, grabbing it tightly with powerful fingers. Jesse looked up to see Coach Schneider standing before him, with a sadistic grin on his ugly, smug face. He likes pretty boys, you know, Grady had said, and for one fleeting moment, Jesse almost wished that the large hand that had grabbed his wrist belonged to Freddy Krueger instead. And then Jesse was back at school, jogging around the edge of the gym floor in his bare feet. He couldn't remember how long he had been running, but his aching lungs and pounding heart told him that it had already been much too long. Coach Snyder watched from the side of the gym, indifferent to Jesse's pain as he continued to run endless laps. Every muscle in his calves and thighs seemingly strained to the breaking point. Round and round he went, the sweat streaming down his body, until he was sure he couldn't run another lap. He was about to collapse when he heard the coach's whistle blowing loudly in his ear. Jesse had hardly stopped running when the coach grabbed him and hurled him violently against the wall of folded wooden bleachers. Hit the showers, barked the coach as Jesse scrambled to his feet and staggered into the locker room. And while Jesse showered, he envisioned the very strange scene that was being enacted at that moment in Coach Snyder's office. The coach had unlocked the equipment locker when he heard the first of the tennis racket strings snap. He stared at the racket and shook his heavy head slowly from side to side. It was very unusual for a string to snap while a racket was hanging on the wall. It was unheard of for a string to give off smoke before snapping. Three strings had sizzled and snapped before the first basketball threw itself off the top shelf of the equipment locker. No sooner had the coach bent down to pick up the ball than two more balls flew out of the metal cabinet and landed at his feet. The fourth ball knocked a trophy off the coach's desk and the fifth struck him sharply on the side of the head. Coach Snyder was still sitting on the floor when the first of the dumbbells went whizzing by. The five-pounder just put a serious dent in the coach's filing cabinet, but the heavier one that followed managed to crack the reinforced glass of the office window. Gym equipment was flying everywhere now as the coach crawled slowly toward the locker, like a soldier creeping beneath a volley of machine gun fire. He had just dodged an especially vicious medicine ball when one of the jump ropes on his desk slithered across the floor, wrapping itself tightly around the coach's wrist before suddenly yanking him off balance. 
Schneider was struggling to free himself when a second rope shot off the top of his desk and looped itself around his other wrist. The coach was screaming for help when the office door slammed open and he was still screaming as the ropes around his wrist dragged him out of the office and into the shower room. Jesse watched in mute horror as the coach was hoisted upward by his wrists, his hands tied in two adjacent shower nozzles, and his face turned to the tiled wall. Suddenly, his clothing fell away like so much soggy tissue paper. A stack of towels came to life, drawing blood as they snapped in midair at Schneider's exposed back and ass. The room was filled with steam now as a tall figure in a red and green sweater and a battered fedora slowly moved toward the coach. <laughs> Cackling insanely, the man in the red and green sweater lifted his right arm to reveal the four sharp blades that fit so perfectly into the cutaway fingers of his glove. And then he brought the blades down cutting four long, deep tears into Coach Schneider's flesh. The coach screamed in agony as the blood began to ooze from his wounds. But his scream seemed only to delight the man with the deadly finger knives. Again and again he struck, slashing away even as his victim's body went limp and blood began to flow from the shower heads. And then Jesse too went limp, falling to his knees in a crimson pool as he stared in disbelief at the bloody glove on his own right hand. Ken Walsh was rudely awakened from a dream of his own when the police brought Jesse home that night. This belong to you? asked the burly cop in the rain slicker. Jesse stood at his side wearing nothing but a large woolen police blanket. His father nodded his head in disbelief as the policeman shoved Jesse into the house. We found him wandering around out on the highway in the rain, completely naked. Try to keep a leash on him, capiche? Jesse's father thanked the officer for his trouble. He waited until the man was gone before turning to Jesse. Let's put our cards on the table, he said in a surprisingly calm voice as he paced the kitchen floor. Jesse sat at the table sipping the hot tea his mother had just made for him. There's not going to be any retribution. No fire and brimstone. I just have two questions for you, son. You answer them and then we'll all go to bed, okay? Jesse took another sip of tea and nodded weakly. Fine, said his father. What are you taking and who are you getting it from? Jesse almost choked on his tea. He shook his head from side to side. I'm not taking drugs, Dad. He turned to his mother, who sat staring at him from across the table. Can I go to bed now? Go ahead, she said, touching his cheek softly with the side of her hand. Jesse's father was still nodding his head slowly, even after Jesse had left the room and disappeared up the stairs. Oh, he's on something, he said, as sure of his son's drug use as he had ever been sure of anything in his life. Jesse's father had not changed his mind by daybreak. He was perched on a ladder removing the security bars from an upstairs window when he saw Jesse run out of the house and jump into his car. He needs professional help, said Jesse's mother as the boy drove off. I think we should take him to a psychiatrist. Are you nuts? asked her husband. He had plenty of problems in his own life, but he had never gone running off to get his head shrunk by some quack with a beard and a funny accent. What the hell is that going to accomplish? I don't know, she admitted. I just know he needs help, and we don't know how to give it to him. Ken began climbing down the ladder, an argumentative expression on his face. Suddenly, his wife turned to him and pointed a threatening finger in his direction. Don't fight with me on this, she said before he could speak. Then she turned away and stomped back toward the house. He needs a kick in the butt is what he needs, I tell ya, Ken shouted. The boy needs a methadone clinic. Cheryl whirled around with the fierce expression that her husband had never seen before in the woman's face. Oh, blow it out your ass, Ken, she said. He was about to reply when he suddenly lost his footing and fell off of the ladder.
Jesse had hardly said a word to Lisa during the entire drive to school that morning. I wish you'd tell me what was bothering you, she said as he pulled into the student parking lot. I'm fine, said Jesse, avoiding the girl's eyes. How could he possibly explain what was happening when he hardly understood it himself? You didn't say more than two words to me the whole way here, Lisa persisted. You had another nightmare, didn't you? Yeah, he said, reluctant to go into detail. I definitely had a bad night. Do you want to talk about it? Jessie turned to her and looked her straight in the eye for the first time that morning. My dad thinks I'm on drugs, my mom thinks I'm crazy, and I'm beginning to think maybe my mom is right, okay? Lisa was about to assure him that everything would be all right when Jesse noticed the crowd that had gathered in front of the gym entrance behind the athletic field. Oh, God, said Jesse, already imagining the worst as he jumped out of the car and dashed across the parking lot. Lisa quickly followed, chasing after the boy as he pushed through the crowd that pressed up against the police barricade. What's going on? asked Jesse, picking Ron Grady out of the noisy crowd. Where you been, man? said Grady, shouting to make himself heard over the hubbub. Fucking Snyder got himself wasted last night! Jesse turned pale, shaking his head slowly from side to side as Grady continued. Fucking guy was working late, and some fruitcake comes in and slices him up like kibasa. Right in the shower, bro. They say there were bloody footprints all over the... But Jesse had already run off, his hand clamped over his mouth in a futile attempt to keep his breakfast from coming up. What's with him? Grady asked Lisa, but the girl just stared at Jesse and wondered the same thing. That night, an intruder visited the Walsh house. Slowly, he climbed the long flight of stairs from the cellar and then continued upstairs to the second floor. On tiptoes, the intruder quietly passed by Jesse's bedroom and then paused before the room in which the boy's parents were fast asleep. He listened to Ken Walsh's loud snoring for a moment before continuing to Angela's room and quietly opening the bedroom door. The little girl slept peacefully in her bed oblivious to the shadow cast by the intruder who stepped between the girl and her nightlight. Angela shifted her small body toward the center of the bed as a taloned glove reached out and pulled back the covers. The intruder leaned forward, his breath hot on the slumbering child's soft neck. Wake up, little girl, he said, his voice hoarse and vaguely seductive. Angela opened her eyes and looked into the intruder's face. What time is it? She asked sleepily. Angela smiled sweetly as she gazed at her big brother, his face drenched with sweat and every muscle in his body tightly clenched. It's late, he whispered in his own familiar voice. He looked around wondering what he was doing in Angela's room in the middle of the night. It's okay, go back to sleep. Angela nodded, closed her eyes and instantly went back to sleep. Jesse reached out to cover her and was startled to see the deadly glove of Freddy Krueger on his own right hand. Jesse spent the rest of the night in his room drinking black coffee and wondering how long a person could survive without sleeping. Chapter 8 Carrie Miller gazed at the gorgeous hunk swimming beside her in Lisa Paletti's oversized swimming pool inside. Carrie knew that Lisa's parents had promised to go inside early tonight and leave her friends alone to party, but so far the Palettis were showing no signs of an early departure. Lisa's dad was still busy flipping hamburgers and hot dogs at the gas grill, wearing that ridiculous chef's hat and the kiss-the-cook apron that he always wore on these occasions. The speakers were blaring one of those goofy Benny Goodman records that Mr. Paletti always insisted on playing at his daughter's parties. What's a party without the King of Swing? Carrie once heard him ask in all seriousness, and the lights around the pool were much too bright for the kind of partying that Carrie had in mind. 
Lisa's mother gave her husband a sharp look as she stepped out of the house carrying a huge platter, brimming with salads and condiments. Mr. Paletti pretended not to notice, but he knew that soon he would have to abandon his watchful post at the barbecue and leave the kids alone. Things had certainly changed since he was a young man. He didn't remember the bathing suits being quite that skimpy or the girls being quite so shapely whenever he was Lisa's age. And these boys, Lisa knew, wow, half of them looked more like full-grown men than high school kids. There was something about the way these kids horsed around together that made Mr. Paletti very reluctant to go inside and leave this group of overactive teenagers unsupervised. It was finally left to Mrs. Paletti to take her husband by the arm and forcefully remove him from the premises. With the greatest reluctance, the man in the oversized chef's hat turned over his spatula to one of the more responsible-looking boys before following Lisa's mother toward the house. We're going to bed now, dear! Mrs. Paletti informed her daughter while Mr. Paletti scowled at a muscular young man who was busy showing off his biceps to a couple of giggling girls in very skimpy bikinis. Thanks, Mom, said Lisa. 12.30, said her father in his sternest voice as he glanced at his watch. Not one minute later. 12.30, agreed Lisa. I promise. And don't forget to lock the gate, shouted Mr. Paletti as his wife literally pulled him into the house. Good night, Daddy, said Lisa. She smiled as her parents disappeared behind the sliding glass doors. She knew he meant well, but... Sometimes her father could be a real pain in the ass. The responsible-looking boy with the spatula was thinking the same thing as he watched the Palettis go inside. He waited until he saw the lights go off upstairs before giving the prearranged signal to the girl waiting next to the cassette machine. Suddenly, Benny Goodman was gone, and the hard rocking sounds of Van Halen were blasted through the speakers. Party time! announced a boy standing at the side of the house. He flicked off most of the lights around the pool while somebody pulled a wagon loaded with beer out of the bushes. Carrie waited until the underwater lights went off before slipping off her bikini top and pressing her young body against the hunk in the swimming pool. All around the pool, boys and girls were beginning to pair off, their hands and mouths eagerly exploring each other's bodies in the warm, dark night. Jesse Walsh sat by himself in a lounge chair at the far corner of the patio with a troubled expression on his face. By the time Lisa pushed her way through the crowd of dancing teenagers, whose writhing bodies blocked her way, Jesse had disappeared into the portable cabana at the edge of the pool. Lisa knocked on the door and called his name. Uh, uh, just a minute! Jesse slipped on his pants and shirt before opening the door. Lisa walked in and shut the door behind her. I think I'd better go, Lise, said Jesse, avoiding Lisa's eyes as he buttoned up his shirt. I'm just not into it tonight. Do you want to talk about it? Lisa rested her hand gently on his back, but he shook it off and stepped away. Just leave me alone, he said. Please. You're not being fair, said Lisa, joining Jesse on the wooden bench as he sat down to put on his shoes. I'm worried about you, Jesse. I want to help you get through this thing. What are you going to do? How can anybody help me? He looked at her with terrified eyes. I'm going crazy, Lisa, and I don't want to have you watch me falling apart. It's okay, Jesse, the girl said, her hand on his shoulder. I don't know what to do, he said, clutching Lisa's hand tightly in his own. I'm afraid to go to sleep, and I'm afraid to stay awake. I don't know what's going to happen to me, Lisa. We'll figure it out together, said Lisa. We'll stay up all night if we have to. I won't let anything happen to you. I promise. He looked into her eyes and she kissed him gently on the mouth. Then she kissed him again, only this time the kiss was a little harder. Jesse put his arms around Lisa and pulled her close. Their lips parted now, their mouths pressed together as they held each other tight. Jesse slipped off his shirt and felt the warmth of Lisa's flesh against his bare chest. Without speaking a word, they slid slowly but deliberately on to the floor of Lisa's cabana. Without speaking a word, they slid slowly but deliberately onto the cabana floor, deliciously lost in their boundless passion. 
Jesse felt Lisa's hand opening the snap on his jeans, sliding open the zipper as he kissed her on the gentle swell of breast that rose over the top of her swimsuit. Lisa closed her eyes, breathing hard, as Jesse reached around to open the small hook at the back of her suit. It was at that moment that Jesse saw the long, thick tongue dart out of his mouth, wiggling wildly in the air for just a moment before flicking back inside. What's wrong? asked Lisa as Jesse pushed himself away and jumped to his feet. I have to go, he said, hastily tucking in his shirt. Lisa was still on the floor looking very confused as Jesse zipped up his jeans and ran out of the cabana. Ron Grady was fast asleep when he felt the hand clamp down over his mouth. The light clicked on to reveal the disheveled figure of Jesse Walsh. Jesus Christ, said Grady, glancing at the open bedroom window as he shook off Jesse's hand. You scared the shit out of me, dude. Sorry, said Jesse. I didn't know where else to go. You have to let me stay here tonight. Grady looked at the clock on his night table and shook his head. No, this is important. Jesse continued. Something really weird is happening. It started out just like bad dreams, uh, but it's starting to get really serious. Go home, said Grady, feeling very tired and cranky. Take a sleeping pill or something and call me in the morning. He flopped back on the bed and threw one arm over his eyes. As a matter of fact, why don't you do the world a favor and take a whole bottle? Jesse sat on the edge of the bed and yanked Grady's arm away from his face. I killed Snyder, he said. Grady opened his eyes and stared at Jesse in disbelief. Oh, only it wasn't me, Jesse continued. I was there, but it was like something moving around inside of me. Then last night it made me go into my sister's room, and tonight with Lisa. He paused, trying to remember exactly what had happened. We were on the floor in the cabana, and my t He stopped abruptly and grabbed Grady by the shoulder. It wanted to kill them, he said, suddenly realizing what the horrible transformation had been all about. Grady stared at him for a long time before offering his own analysis of the situation. You're fucked in the head, he said. I'm scared, Grady, said Jesse, oblivious to the other boy's skepticism. I, I know it sounds crazy, but there's something trying to get into my body. Grady shook his head and grinned lewdly. The only thing trying to get into your body is female and waiting for you on a cabana floor, dude. And you want to sleep with me? Huh, go figure. Look, said Jesse. I don't care if you believe me or not. I believe you. You had some scary dreams, right? No! Jesse shook his head, no longer certain of what to believe. I don't know. Everything's all mixed up. The important thing is that I'm in trouble and I need your help. Grady looked at Jesse and sighed. Trouble was something he understood. What do you want me to do? Just watch me, said Jesse. If anything weird happens, like if I have a nightmare or I start walking in my sleep, you have to bring me out of it. Hit me over the head if you have to, just don't let me leave. Grady started to crack wise, but thought better of it. Instead, he just nodded in agreement. And, and whatever you do, Grady, Jesse added, settling himself into the chair next to the bed. For God's sake, man, don't fall asleep. Right, right, said Grady, turning on the TV with his remote control. He was watching for less than half an hour when he became aware of Jesse's soft snoring at his side. Sweet dreams, buddy, Grady whispered as he turned off the TV. He watched Jesse sleeping peacefully for a moment and thought about what the boy had told him. It took Grady less than a minute to decide that only a real jerk would take Jesse's crazy story seriously. He turned off the light and pulled the cover up over his shoulders to settle in for a good night's sleep. And then Jesse's eyes snapped open. It's happening again, he said, flinging himself out of the chair and onto the floor. Grady was on his feet in an instant, but he didn't know what to do for the boy who was now twisting and writhing on his bedroom floor, clutching his stomach, and flailing about in unbearable agony. 
Grady had never seen anyone throw a fit, but he knew that Jesse was suffering something far more intense than any ordinary seizure. From the look on his face, Grady guessed that Jesse felt like someone strapped into an electric chair at the moment the switch is thrown. Jesse, he said, feeling more helpless and frustrated than he ever had before in his life. But Jesse just rolled silently on the floor, his body contorted as if every fiber of his being were undergoing some excruciating transformation. Then slowly he raised his right hand, his fingers extended and spread far apart. Grady watched in horror as four razor-sharp blades emerged from within the tips of Jesse's fingers, like new teeth breaking through a baby's gums. Then, as if some crazed beast were tearing its way through his flesh, Jesse's skin began peeling away. Suddenly, his chest literally burst open as countless capillaries exploded in the air. A fine spray of blood forming a hazy crimson cloud around the figure that once was Jesse Walsh. And out of that cloud stepped a man, a man in a filthy red and green sweater, an evil grin on the disfigured face beneath his battered fedora. For just one moment, Grady would have sworn that he saw Jesse's tormented expression covering the man's face like some obscene Halloween mask. Grady made a quick break for the door, but his speed was no match for that of the creature in the dirty sweater. Lifting Grady by the throat, he cackled wickedly while the boy struggled in vain to free himself from the monster's iron grip. Grady's parents were already at the door, pounding on the outside while their son hung helplessly in the air on the other side. The Grady's were still trying to break the door down when they heard the first of their son's screams. They jumped back as four sharp and reddened blades ripped through the wooden door, the blood of Ron Grady oozing from the knife holes as if the door itself were bleeding. The blades wiggled free and then pierced the door again as Ron Grady screamed for the last time, his vital organs already shredded beyond any hope of repair. Inside the room, the man in the red and green sweater released his victim, watching as the boy's mutilated body slid lifelessly to the floor in a pool of his own blood. And then Jesse looked at his reflection in the mirror and saw the evil face of Freddy Krueger leering back at him. You son of a bitch! He shouted, pulling the blood-drenched glove off his hand and hurling it at the mirror with all his might. You killed him! The mirror cracked, but the face in the mirror was still laughing maniacally as Jesse fled screaming into the night. Chapter 9 Lisa's party was still going strong when Jesse staggered to the Paletti's front door. Oh my god, said Lisa as Jesse collapsed in her arms, his clothes torn and dirty and covered with blood. I killed him, said Jesse, still trying to make sense of it. I killed them both. Lisa held him tightly in her arms as the tears rushed to his eyes. I killed Grady, he said. I killed Grady. And I killed Schneider, too, don't you see? He said, his damp eyes widening with the horror of it. The bastard is inside of me. What are you talking about, Jesse? Who's inside you? He's just waiting to take me, Jesse said, still gasping for breath after the long run from Grady's house. He gets me when I fall asleep, don't you see? Who, Jesse? Lisa persisted. Who's waiting to get you? Kruger, he said, spitting out the name like some foul curse. Fred Kruger's been trying to get a hold of me ever since I moved here. He needs me to get out of his world and into ours. He's been using me all along, and he's going to use me again. This isn't happening, said Lisa, looking Jesse hard in the eye and trying to make him understand the absurdity of what he was saying. This isn't happening, Jesse. You're just confused. It's Snyder, and the glove, and the diary. No! He shouted, pushing her away in frustration. You don't understand what I'm telling you. He tried to make me kill Angela last night. 
Look at my hands. He held out his bloody hands and started to cry again. I killed Grady, he repeated, trying desperately to make sense out of all the insanity. And then he realized the horrible truth. He owns me, he said, staring at Lisa with eyes suddenly drained of all hope. But Lisa was not prepared to surrender. She took him to her arms and held him close, stroking his wild hair as she spoke. Nobody's going to take you from me, she said, her voice soft and reassuring. There's got to be a logical explanation for everything. Jesse, all we have to do is figure it out. Then she remembered something Nancy Thompson had written. Wait a minute, she said, leading Jesse into the study. She reached into a desk drawer and pulled out the red leather-bound diary. Listen to this, she said, flipping to the last entry. He is evil itself, she read, her voice trembling with excitement. I know now that I brought him into my world. We all did. Our screams gave him all the energy he needed. Now I'll take it back. Now I will deny him his energy. Lisa closed the book and held it up for Jesse to see. Nancy wasn't crazy. All of this really happened. Jesse shook his head from side to side, unable to absorb whatever it was that Lisa was trying to tell him. It's true, Lisa said. You can fight him. Remember what I said about good energy and bad energy? Fred Krueger is bad energy. He thrives on our anger and our hatred and our fear. All we have to do is stop being afraid of him. Jesse was about to ask how they were supposed to do that when he suddenly felt the sharp pain in his stomach. He's coming back, he gasped, clutching his middle. Get out of here, Lisa! At that moment, every window in the house slammed shut and locked. The deadbolt on the front door slid into place with a loud snap. Fight it, Jesse, said Lisa, struggling not to be swallowed up by her own fear. Upstairs, Mr. Paletti sat up with a start as the latch on the bedroom door snapped shut. The temperature in the study had risen to well over 100 degrees. Lisa's clothes clung to her sweat-soaked body as she watched Jesse rolling in agony on the floor. You created him, she said, shaking the boy and trying to make him understand. You can destroy him. He lives off your fear, Jesse. You can fight him. I can't said Jesse, gasping for breath as Freddy struggled to push his way out. In the living room, the water in the aquarium had begun to bubble. Three poached angelfish floated lifelessly to the surface. Outside, Carrie was surprised to see a steamy mist rising from the surface of the swimming pool. Across the patio, a tray full of hot dogs had suddenly burst into flames. Moments later, the bulbs and the Japanese lanterns around the pool began to explode. A couple who tried to escape discovered that someone had padlocked the iron gate around the patio. You can't be afraid of him, Lisa screamed as Jesse writhed on the floor. The bastard doesn't even exist. But even as she spoke, she saw the four razor-sharp blades that were gouging deep channels on the edge of the desk to which Jesse was clinging. The water in the aquarium came to a boil. The glass shattered, flooding the living room carpet with steaming water and dead fish. Then the TV came on for just a second before the picture tube exploded. Damn doors jammed shut, Mr. Valetti told his wife, yanking on the doorknob. The clock radio at the side of the bed had slowly begun to melt. Meanwhile, the water in the swimming pool had reached the simmering point, and choppy waves were breaking against the sides of the pool. Carrie and her new boyfriend were trying to climb to safety, but they were driven back by the hot, stormy waters. Tears were streaming down Carrie's face as she felt her skin begin to blister in the heat. He can't fight me, Freddy told Lisa, rising from the floor with a look of triumph on his horribly scarred face. I'm Jesse now. And then the creature in the red and green sweater was on his feet, his finger knives gleaming in the lamplight. The awful glove swung toward Lisa, but the girl countered by catching the blades in the woolen afghan she snatched from the back of her mother's favorite chair. 
Before Freddy could plan his next attack, she lifted the heavy brass lamp from the top of the desk and brought it down over his head. As he stumbled backward, bellowing with rage, Lisa ran out of the study and slammed the door shut behind her. Jesse! She shouted, reaching the front door only to discover that it was locked from the outside. She turned to run the other way and collided with the charging figure of Fred Krueger. While Lisa lay on the floor catching her breath, Freddy grabbed her by the foot and sank his sharp teeth into her bare calf. Lisa screamed in pain and kicked him hard in the head with her other foot. She rolled away just as he brought down his steel talons, escaping to the kitchen while Freddy struggled to free his weapon from the oak floor in which it was now embedded. Searching frantically through the kitchen, Lisa had succeeded in locating some weapons of her own. As Freddy burst into the room, she grabbed the heaviest and sharpest knife in her parents' collection of gourmet cutlery. Help me, Jesse! She called, the 14-inch butcher's knife clenched tightly in her fist. I said, I'm Jesse now, repeated Freddy, raising his own sharp blades and clicking them menacingly in the air. He smiled at the girl as if to acknowledge that she had put up a good fight. Lisa shook her head slowly from side to side, struggling to find the courage to drive her knife deep into the monster's heart. And then she saw the change in Freddy's expression. Kill me, he pleaded. Please! The voice coming from the creature's mouth slowly became Jesse Walsh's. Lisa stepped back and lowered the knife. Suddenly, a wicked grin came over Freddy's face, and the hoarse voice that issued from his twisted lips was once again his own. Go ahead, Lisa, he croaked. Kill him! Kill him good! He stepped forward, and Lisa swung her knife at him. Freddy laughed and jumped back, the blade just inches from his chest. He attacked again, and this time Lisa drove her knife deep into the monster's shoulder. And now she was filled with rage, hating this grotesque beast for all the pain and suffering he had caused. Again and again she plunged her knife into Freddy's retreating form, slowly driving him back across the room. Then he spoke to her, his voice again that of Jesse. Lisa! he said. Lisa, I love you. She was crying now, her knife raised high as tears streamed down her cheeks. And then Freddy grabbed her wrist and Lisa knew that Jesse was gone. The knife fell from her hand as the monster tightened his grip, his own glistening blades raised high for the kill. Please, God, she whispered, her eyes shut tight as she prepared to die. And then she opened her eyes and saw Freddy staring at her with a look that was more to be pitied than feared. They stood there for what felt like an eternity before the creature suddenly released her wrist and tossed her aside. No! He shouted in a tortured voice that was not quite Jesse's but not quite Freddy's either. Lisa was still lying where the creature had thrown her when he let out a scream of unbearable pain and, and flung himself through the glass patio door. And as the glass shattered into a thousand shimmering pieces, Freddy Krueger disappeared. Meanwhile, the swimming pool ceased its violent swirling. Coughing and trembling, Carrie and her boyfriend climbed out, never before so happy just to be on dry land. Upstairs, the latch on the bedroom door snapped open. Mr. and Mrs. Paletti stepped into the hallway to breathe the cool, fresh air. The temperature throughout the house had dropped to a tolerable level almost as abruptly as it had risen. There was a long moment of silent relief as life suddenly returned to normal. And then the ground below the patio began to shake and rumble, and the horrible figure of Fred Krueger came crashing up from beneath the concrete. Lisa's friends screamed in terror as the sky suddenly darkened and the waters once again began to churn and boil. Freddy was laughing maniacally, his finger knives raised high as he grabbed kids at random and tossed them kicking and screaming into the boiling waters. Boys and girls were running in every direction as Freddy lashed out wildly with his fingers of death. 
The patio was soon drenched with blood, and Lisa's guests began stumbling over the fallen bodies of their slashed and bloody friends in their desperate attempts to escape. Those who attempted to climb the chain-link fence surrounding the pool quickly discovered that the fence had turned as untouchably hot as the shrubbery that was bursting into flames at the side of the house. His dark eyes gleaming with evil joy, Freddy lifted one of the boys high over his head, swinging him in the air before sending him flying into the gas grill with a bone-shattering crash. A huge tongue of flame shot high into the air as Freddy gleefully slashed out at his helpless victims. You're all my children now, Freddy said, his arms raised high overhead in triumph. Suddenly, a shotgun blast rang out from the living room, shattering the bowl of potato salad at Freddy's side. Several teenagers ducked for cover as Mr. Paletti raised his pump-action shotgun again and prepared to blow Fred Krueger's head off. No! screamed Lisa, knocking the barrel of the gun off target as the second shell exploded harmlessly into the cabana wall. What the hell are you doing? demanded Mr. Paletti, glaring angrily at his daughter. But Lisa was not looking at her father. Lisa was staring at the creature in the red and green sweater, who now studied her with an odd expression, halfway between utter contempt and undying gratitude. And then the sky lightened and the water stopped churning as the creature turned away and walked effortlessly through a brick wall. Where the hell did he go? asked Mr. Paletti, looking down only long enough to reload his shotgun. Lisa knew, but she didn't answer. By the time her father looked up, the girl was already gone. Chapter 10 the hardest part of Lisa's trip to the old powerhouse was getting Jesse's Falcon to start. Once she found the right wires to twist together and the right switches to throw in the makeshift car, it was relatively simple to wind her way along the twisted unlit roads that led to the abandoned generating plant. Lisa had no idea how the man in the red and green sweater would manage to transport himself to his beloved boiler room, but she knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that he would be there when she arrived. It was not until she pulled up to the building and shut off the engine that the wound in her leg began to throb. Lisa tore a strip of cloth from her shirt and wrapped it tightly around her calf where Freddy had bitten her before stepping out of the car. A pair of wild dogs blocked the entrance to the powerhouse. The beast growled deep in their throats as Lisa approached and she could see the thick string of saliva that hung down from the powerful jaws beneath their sharp teeth. I'm not afraid, Lisa said aloud, forcing herself to believe her own words as she approached the heavy iron door. The growls turned to threatening barks as the dogs began snapping at Lisa's hands. I said, I'm not afraid, she said again, ignoring the vicious beast and passing through unharmed. She was in the power plant now, but the huge building looked vastly different than it had on her previous visit with Jesse. This time, the old pipes were alive with steam that leaked out from between rusty rivets and torn gaskets, and there was a constant pounding noise as the ancient expansion tanks steadily belched their rancid air. The room seemed bathed in an eerie blue light and white-hot arcs of electricity flashed intermittently in the distant corners of the building. Lisa wondered how much of what she saw was illusion, and how much was real. Touching her fingers to a large steam pipe, she quickly discovered that the heat of the pipes was very real indeed. It suddenly occurred to her how lucky she had been to guess right about the wild dogs outside. Lisa was studying her blistered fingers when she noticed that her injured leg had begun to ache, she casually reached down to rub the wound and felt something move on her fingers. Lisa looked down to find her makeshift bandage swarming with big, black carpenter ants. She screamed and, quaking with disgust, began brushing the ants away with both hands. And then, as abruptly as they had appeared, the ants were gone. Lisa stared at her blood-soaked bandage for a moment, 
took a deep breath and continued her voyage into the bowels of the old boiler room. She was halfway up the rusted iron stairway leading to the catwalk when she thought she heard the horrible sound of metal scraping against metal. She whirled around prepared for the worst. There was no one there. She continued to climb until she reached the walkway. There to greet her was the same giant rat she and Jessie had encountered on their previous visit. It fixed her with its evil red eyes and showed its pointy teeth. I'm not afraid, she said, but this time she didn't believe her own words. The vicious creature who was about to leap at her was no illusion. And then a large black cat appeared from nowhere and pounced on the unsuspecting rat. The cat stared at Lisa with strange yellow eyes as it slowly devoured the rat, the rodent's tail protruding obscenely from its mouth while it slowly munched on the rat with loud bone-crunching noises. Lisa felt herself on the verge of throwing up as she watched the rat's long tail slowly slide past the cat's pink lips and down its gullet. The cat chomped on its prey one more time, swallowed noisily, and then growled its satisfaction with a roar befitting a small mountain lion. Lisa gazed into the creature's demonic eyes for a moment and knew for sure that this was no ordinary pussycat. This was a pussycat that could devour a teenage girl as easily as it had consumed the rat. She turned and ran, her footsteps clanging noisily on the steel mesh flooring. She felt the catwalk begin to give way beneath her feet and grabbed hold of the iron handrail. Lisa was breathing hard now as she jumped to safety, running fast without knowing where she was going or what she would find when she got there. And then she saw Freddy Krueger and began to scream. You had your chance, he said, raising high his talon glove. Now you die! Lisa ducked just in time as the finger knife slashed out and scraped horribly against a steam pipe. She turned to run and saw that the walkway was now glowing, a steamy mist rising from its red-hot surface. There was nowhere to run. There was nowhere to hide. Come to me, Lisa! Freddy croaked, a twisting smile on his ugly face. I'm waiting for you! Stop him, Jesse! cried Lisa, fighting back her tears. I know you're in there! I told you! Jesse's dead! said the monster, stepping closer as he clicked his finger knives in Lisa's face. Freddy's here! Lisa took a step back, but it was of no use. She felt the sting as Freddy struck out, his blades just nicking the flesh of her shoulder. Jesse! She screamed, trying desperately not to lose her faith. Wanna join your little friend? Said Freddy. Lisa smelled the creature's foul breath and almost puked for the second time that day. Where's Jessie? She demanded, forcing herself to sound more brave than she actually felt. There is no Jessie. I'm Jesse now! I want him back, she insisted. Talk to me, Jesse! Jesse! Freddy just laughed. <laughs> Shaking his ugly head slowly from side to side, he raised his steel blades to Lisa's face the sharp points almost touching her eyes. Lisa forced herself to look beyond the deadly blades, summoning all of her remaining strength and courage to look directly into the creature's fearsome eyes. I love you, Jessie, meaning it as she had never meant anything before in her life. The monster stared at her, a look of doubt and confusion in his cat-like eyes. His hand began to tremble slightly. He shifted his gaze to the glove on his right hand, as if he weren't quite sure how it got there. And then he began to bleed. He was bleeding from the same shoulder and chest wounds that had refused to bleed when Lisa inflicted them back at the house. Now they were gushing, and Freddy stared in disbelief as blood poured down his chest and arms. Then the look of disbelief changed to one of weakness and pain as the bloody creature staggered back to lean against the iron railing. Lisa dashed past him. She was about to run for safety when she heard Jessie's voice calling her name. Lisa! 
he said. Come and get me. She turned around and heard the ugly sound of Freddy's wicked laughter. Come and get him. Come and get him. Lisa, come and get him. Freddy croaked and teased, clicking his finger knives in the air, still leaning against the railing for support. Lisa stepped toward him, suddenly more angry than frightened. The time for playing cat and mouse games had come to an end. I'm not afraid of you, she said, looking the bloody creature straight in the eye. You couldn't kill Angela, and you can't kill me. Jesse's in there, and I want him back. Jesse's dead! Jesse's dead! Screamed Freddy, sounding less sure of himself than before. I sliced him good! I sliced him real good! Lisa just shook her head and took another step closer. I'm gonna take him away from you, and you're going straight back to hell, bastard! He's dead! Freddy screamed, but Lisa just went on shaking her head. Come back to me, Jesse, she said, her eyes looking right through Freddy's. I love you. I love you. Freddy dropped to one knee as Lisa moved closer. I'll kill you, croaked Freddy, but there was no conviction left in his voice. His blades clicked weakly at his side. He can't hold you, Jesse said Lisa, ignoring Freddy's threats. He's losing his grip. You can get out if you want to. He'll die with me, Freddy muttered, but Lisa just shook her head and knelt beside him. He'll die with both of us, said Freddy, as the girl took off his hat and began to stroke his head. Freddy lifted his right hand and pressed his glove against Lisa's chest. She felt the painful sting of the blades but made no move to escape. Instead, she came in closer and touched her lips to his. The creature flinched and moved his talons to her back, but he was too weak to drive the blades home. He shivered as she embraced him, her mouth now pressed against his in a passionate, life-confirming kiss. And then smoke began to rise from his body, and he pushed her away with a scream of excruciating agony. The noise of the ancient machinery was deafening now as the temperature in the room began to soar. Suddenly, a flame shot across the railing against which Freddy leaned, and small fires broke out along the catwalk. The paint on the walls began to bubble and peel as pipes everywhere started to burst. Valve wheels flew off and rolled noisily down the flaming catwalks. Steam shot out from every punctured pipe as the entire boiler room filled with smoke and flame. Lisa watched in mute horror as Freddy's flesh began to melt, his pain-racked features sliding off his exposed skull like wax dripping off a candle. And then he was on fire, his dense, all-engulfing flame becoming one with the fire that was rapidly consuming the entire powerhouse. And just as suddenly, the fires began to die out. In a matter of moments, the deafening noise began to abate, and the smoke cleared. Big fires turned to little fires, which soon died down to harmless clouds of sooty smoke. A cool blue light suffused the vast boiler room. Lisa looked at the charred and smoldering corpse of Freddy Krueger and gasped. The blackened body had begun to stir. Then the creature turned to her, but the singed and sooty figure that slowly rose to its knees was not the fiendish Freddy Krueger at all. Jesse Walsh rose to his feet. His eyes glazed as if he were awakening at long last from a horrible and vaguely remembered nightmare. Jesse kissed his mom goodbye just as the shiny new school bus pulled up to the curb. His right arm was in a sling, and he still had some minor burns and bruises, but he was feeling about as good as he had ever felt in his life. Jesse hurried onto the bus and saw Lisa waving at him from the back. A grin on his face, he made his way quickly down the aisle, shaking a hand or two as he greeted his admiring schoolmates. Hi he said, giving Lisa a quick kiss before sitting down beside her. He draped his good arm around the girl's shoulder, 
careful to avoid the bandage that covered her still healing wound. Lisa returned his greeting and then chuckled. What's so funny? asked Jesse. We must look like a couple of escapees from a veteran's hospital, said Lisa with a smile. Jesse laughed and shook his head. I still can't believe that we actually... Lisa cut him off in mid-sentence by putting a finger gently to his lips. He nodded in agreement. Some things are better left unspoken. I love you, said Jesse. I love you too, she said, gazing deeply into his eyes. They hugged and Jesse's lips gently nuzzled the girl's ear. Then they looked at each other again and Lisa closed her eyes. This is what it's all about, thought Jesse, as he leaned forward to kiss her tenderly on the lips. And at that moment, the talon glove of Freddy Krueger ripped through Lisa's chest and thrust its razor-sharp blades toward Jesse's eyes. Jesse was still screaming as the bus shifted into high gear, racing madly into the desert with flashing lights and sparking dashboard as the nightmare continued. <laughs> Okay, Slashaholics, this has been A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. The novelization by Jeffrey Cooper. Hope you've all have enjoyed this novelization of the movie. It was pretty much a carbon copy of the film itself. It didn't have a bunch of differences like Part 3 did. I did notice a few slight differences, though, but nothing major, you know. Um, this movie, the movie Nightmare 2... It's not my least favorite in the series. It's probably about mid-tier somewhere, closer to the end. But I don't hate the movie. It just changes all the roles. It's like the red-headed stepchild of the series. Um, really, this book has a lot more in common with the uh, Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror books. Um, because in those books, it's Freddy possessing somebody in every uh, book. Uh, I've done one of those on the channel. I'm going to be doing the other five very soon. Uh, awesome author, David Bergantino wrote four of them out of the six. Um, and he'll, uh, he'll, you know, he'll jump on, do an intro and stuff, and he'll join us on the podcast whenever we talk about, uh, each of those tales, uh, of terror books, uh, in that young adult series. I gotta know, though, how did Jesse not get arrested? I mean, he had to leave DNA behind and stuff. At the end, he's all, like, happy... Well, it is a nightmare at the end, so I guess he could technically be in a jail cell somewhere having this nightmare about Freddy's glove coming out of uh, coming out of Lisa's chest and then the bus taking off. Or, like part one, maybe the entire movie was just a nightmare that Freddy was putting him through for fun before killing him. Huh. That, that was always one of my biggest questions is, you know... How did he get away with it? You'd think he would have left DNA uh, killing Grady, killing Schneider. Either that or they would have found Freddy Krueger's DNA. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe he is in a jail cell or, uh, you know, sleeping. Or maybe this whole thing was a nightmare. Uh, anyways. Man, I just don't know what I can really say more about uh, Freddy's Revenge. Uh, if you uh, listen to this in the uh, playlist form, uh, like whenever I put the uh, two to three chapters up uh, per upload... You know, I had a few things to say in the commentary at the end of each of those uploads, but not much, uh, not as much as I usually do, because there's really not a lot to say. We all know this movie. Uh, very strange that it's the whole possession angle thing, uh, a big difference from part one. Uh, but I do like how this is our first visit to the real boiler room. Um, the book didn't really fill in, you know, the stuff at the party. We're not going to hurt you, that whole scene. I was kind of disappointed that wasn't thrown in. And, uh, I gotta say, 
I was disappointed, kind of, that the dogs didn't have little human baby faces, you know, that creepy, it just wasn't there, it was just normal dogs. Um, so a lot of the weird stuff from the movie didn't make it into the book, but there was a few slight differences, so I'm, this isn't my favorite novelization so far, uh, but it's not my least favorite uh, out of all the books I've done by a long stretch. Uh, let me know what you guys and gals thought of this book in the comment section below. And I'll be back very soon with more Slasher Mayhem on the 80 Slasher Librarian YouTube channel. Come on into the 80 Slasher Library. Stay as long as you want. We got a huge selection of Slasher novelizations, tie-ins, whatever you're looking for. Just be careful, because as you know, in this library, the late fees are a killer! Ha <laughs> ha! Have a good night, everybody, and don't forget, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, and pleasant dreams! There's a lover in the story, but the story's still the same. There's a lullaby for suffering and a paradox to blame. But it's written in the scriptures and it's not some idle claim. You want it darker. We kill the flame. They're lining up the prisoners and the guards are taking aim. I struggled with some demons, they were middle class and tame. I didn't know I had permission to murder and to maim. You want it darker. Darker, we kill the flame.